All right, good afternoon, everyone. Um, my name is Sumit Gupta. I'm with IBM, and I'm responsible for high-performance computing and high-performance data analytics at IBM. Um, I wanted to give a perspective, and it's so uh, good to give this perspective right after an Oak Ridge conversation because uh, this perspective is around data-centric computing and really how we're seeing the data center move where what used to be high-performance computing has really intersected high-performance data analytics, or vice versa, if, if, uh, if, if you want to do it that, say it that way. So let's see. Clicker this way. So I'll say some things which are going to be obvious. So the first three slides are obvious slides, but I'm going to say them anyway, just to set context. Data is a new basis of competitive value. And what I mean by that is, you know, people say we have a big data problem. It's not a big data problem. It's the big data opportunity. It's an opportunity because we finally have the analytics capability, the computing capability, the software, whether it's machine learning, deep learning, cognitive computing, to actually take advantage of all the data that we're collecting. Uh, some of the more advanced cars out there are, have up to 200 sensors in them that are constantly sending data back. Healthcare, banking, oil and gas, retail, some of the big examples where there's just tons of data coming back. You, you look at the retail uh, ecosystem, and you have point-of-sale data, but it's not tied well tied into the inventory systems. So you have you know, socks running out at your local target, and uh, they, you know, they may have a bunch of them down the road in, a, in, a, in, a, in one of their warehouses, but that connection has not been made. Um, I guess you've got to point this way to get this thing to work. There we go. Um, now, the interesting thing is, you know, people talk about unstructured data. You know, there's a concept of uncertain data. And, I, you know, I have a feeling Rob High might have shown the same slide this morning in his conversation around Watson, but... The interesting thing is we think we have a big data problem. It's going to get really bad in four years, right? It's, and it's, it's to the point where we can't store all of this anymore. We're at a point where just the storage costs are phenomenal. So what we're going to start doing much more often is quickly using data in, in a useful way. In other words, it's, it, you don't necessarily have to store 40 zettabytes of data but you have to use 40 zettabytes of data to get value out of it. And the other thing is the amount of uncertain or unstructured data is growing as a percentage of the total data that you're collecting, right? And that's a really important thing, right? How do you connect all the social media signals that are coming in with all the purchasing behavior that you're seeing or the banking behavior that you're seeing out there? And then, of course, we're now at this era of cognitive computing. You, you saw this conference is dedicated to deep learning. Deep learning is one of the methods within the cognitive computing ecosystem. Uh, you, you look at cognitive computing, you have machine learning, predictive analytics, you have deep learning. You have all these things that get pulled together to build a system that is uh, essentially inspecting data and providing insight, very much like we do. Right? We look at things, and we, we, we actually produce insight out of data. We don't actually necessarily say, you know, we, we don't say one, zero. We actually actually have some insight the way we, we compute on data. Um, so there's a real big opportunity to use cognitive computing to take advantage of this data and really transform businesses. Now, I work at IBM, and I work in open power. I have to pitch power. Uh, we fundamentally believe and we fundamentally architected power for big data, for cognitive computing. Right? We didn't try to make the weak core. We didn't say we're going to make the lowest performance, highly energy efficient, low power core. We didn't say we'll make the middle guy. We said we'll make the fastest. We'll make the best processor. We'll put the most memory on it. We'll put the most memory bandwidth on it. And we firmly believe in accelerated computing. So we'll put interfaces on it that allow us to connect to accelerators, that allow us not just to connect, but to do pure computing. Right? We don't treat the accelerator as a secondary processor. We treat it as a peer. The power processor, the CPU, and the GPU is our peers. They both are important for computing. 
and we want them to behave like peers. The minute you think like that, you then say, well, guess what? The GPU or the accelerator needs full access to memory because that's where the data is. That's why we worked with NVIDIA to put NVLink on the power processor. Right? So there's a fundamental, once you believe in something, there's a fundamental change in your behavior, and that's what you see in how we do open power. Now, the other interesting thing that's happening, and, and you know, um, the HPC community has been very guilty of this, is the fixation with one number. And the HPC community made that number or that benchmark LINPAC. But if you look at real workloads, real workloads depend on all kinds of things, right? Memory bandwidth, the size of the memory connected to the socket. You know, <laughs> Dirk is uh, smiling because he knows I, I'm, I'm speaking the truth here, right? And, and he's actually been a big champion of this. Depending on the application, does it care about floating point or integer? And if it's floating point, what kind of floating point? If you're doing seismic processing, single precision is good enough. But in the oil and gas market, if you're doing reservoir simulation, you need double precision. Deep learning, we heard it yesterday, FP16. They want lots of FP16, right? Memory, you look at any database. It is memory hungry, it is memory bandwidth hungry, and you want memory everywhere, inside the CPU, outside the CPU, in the, uh, in the hard disk, you know, in the storage system, and you want fast access to it. So that's, these are the design metrics. When I say power was built for, uh, for big data and cognitive, these were the design metrics that we thought of, right? And we partner with the accelerators to provide the right floating point. We partner with them. Now, if, if you kind of think of this data-centric perspective, right, if you think that the world is moving to be data-centric, you stop thinking about flops. You stop thinking of just one metric, and you start thinking about workflows. You start thinking about data movement. You know, we, we, uh, re we've been working with a lot of genomics institutes. It's really interesting. When we walk into a genomics institute, the first discussion we have with them is not about processors. It's about how are you managing your data? Because, the, you know, it's funny, I, I won't name the customer because they probably won't appreciate me say, uh, telling the full story. But uh, I was talking to a customer, and, and the person I was talking to, the person we engaged with, was very excited about our platform, very excited about what we were doing around accelerators. Then the director of the lab walks in, stays for five minutes, and he says, okay, I got to go. You know, it's a courtesy visit. And as he's going, he says, I say, just before you go, what is your number one concern uh, these days? He says storage, right? So we had just spent one hour of what we thought was a wonderful meeting talking about compute when the director of the lab's only concern was storage and data, right? We changed the conversation, right? We start talking about data movement. We start talking about uh, how to architect a data-centric system, which led to their workflow being faster. So that's the most important thing. How do you transform the discussion from being compute to being data-centric? I, I drew a seismic imaging. Um, uh, I, I took a seismic imaging workflow here. And, and the reason why I took this, or I should say seismic workflow, uh, was because imaging, which is where a lot of us have spent a lot of time in HPC, is one aspect of this workflow, right? It's the, it's the middle aspect, right, where you're, you're actually taking... Uh, um, you're creating an image of the subsurface. But there's so much more here. There's so much more. And the oil and gas industry is collecting even more data from sensors that are on their boats, that are on their drills. They want to do things like um, uh, well planning, uh, drill, drilling planning, where they actually have a drill that turns based on the data it's collecting on its sensor. So imagine you're not drilling straight anymore. You're drilling, going around rocks and everything, and you, those decisions are being made in real time by a machine because they have sensors on them. This clicker is a little slow. There we go. <laughs> so I'll give you a, a, an interesting example around data-centric. Uh, and this is around uh, the notion of minimizing data movement, moving the data, uh, moving the compute to where the data is. So uh, NoSQL databases um, often have in-memory analytics. So what that means is they use the system memory, the CPU memory, to keep all the data and do analytics on it. Uh, so for example, Redis Labs is one of the NoSQL databases. 
Now, the way you implement this is because the amount of memory that you can connect to a CPU is limited, you end up building a cluster like that one, which has, let's say, 80 nodes in it, only because you want a lot of memory, not because you're using the CPUs. In fact, if, when you profile this, you'll find that the CPUs are idle. I mean, they're doing data movement, right? And now you have this kludge of networking behind it. So we saw this, and we said, well, wait a minute. The real problem we want to solve is give it a lot of memory. So we took one of the interfaces that's on the Power8 processor, on the Open Power processor called CAPI, which is a coherent interface. We connected a flash array to it. And effectively, what it looks like to the application is that now you have a system memory that's 40 terabytes. So it takes that flash array and makes it look like system memory. Right. So we were able to reduce that system into this system, which is one server with a flash array. And the NoSQL databases are flying on this. So we got Redis. We've been working with Neo4j. We've been working on Cassandra. And uh, the, the, the big advantage is, you know, from a user's perspective, first of all, just removing that network dramatically improves latency. Right, dramatic performance and benefit there. But I mean, I, I think this picture says it all, right? I mean, you just go from that infrastructure to this infrastructure. And this comes from thinking about the problem from a data centric perspective. And the interesting thing here also is, you know, this is really where HPC and big data, you can see the merge happening now. It's funny, I showed this, uh, I, I, I made a similar presentation two days ago uh, in the GPU technologies conference side of this. And one of the NVIDIA guys who was there says, comes back to me, and he, you know, all I'll say is he works in the defense sector, and he says, man, I got some HPC customers who, who really need this, so we got to talk, right? And, and that's it, I said, yep, you know, we invented something for databases, which clearly, clearly has benefits all across any high-performance computing use case, right? Not technical computing necessarily, but any high-performance computing use case. Um, we already heard a really good talk around uh, Coral, so I won't repeat that, but I think the point I'll make on this slide is, um, you know, we have some really nice wins on open power with our partners, NVIDIA, Mellanox, and these wins in the U.S. and the U.K., you know, the way I always like to think of the story is these clients had full view of our roadmap for the next five to 10 years because the decision they're making is really a 10-year decision. And the reason is there's a lot of software work they have to do, right? So they're really making a much more thoughtful long-term decision. They had full view of our roadmap. They had full view of our competitor's roadmap. And they chose the open power roadmap open power and partner roadmap, because this is the roadmap that actually delivers them a system that's scalable in the future, that leads to higher performance in the future. And the other really interesting aspect that's happening is um, the, Watson's, the work we're doing in Watson around cognitive computing is really, is really intercepting the HPC market. So it's, it's funny. Uh, we obviously have Rob High give the keynote this morning here, which uh, NVIDIA invited him to. But, but, but the point was, we're seeing the demand. We're seeing the pull from the HPC community. Um, the, it's, one of the things I asked our team to do was put a Watson hands-on lab here. And they were going to do one. So then I asked, so, well, how many people can go through one lab? They said about, I think, 50 people. I said, wait, wait, wait. We've got 5,000 people here. We can't just do a lab for 50 people. That makes no sense. Can we repeat it? So they ended up repeating it four times. Unfortunately, it didn't go up on the schedule till Friday. So, and the first lab was Monday morning, 9 a.m. So now I'm, I'm over the weekend. I'm like, uh-oh, I'm in trouble. I got all these IBM Watson people to fly out to do a lab. There's no one going to be there because they don't know about it. 9 a.m., standing room only. Standing room only, right? It was packed. Right, so I, I was, of course, I knew it. That's what I'm going to tell everyone. I knew it, but <laughs> that was pretty close. <laughs> um, now we, we talked about NVLink uh, before, but let me let me highlight the value here. This is another uh, instance of minimizing data movement, bringing the compute to where the data is. PCIe has been a challenge because it has really limited the number of applications that can take advantage of GPU accelerators. Right. NVLink completely changes that. Uh, we, we connect NVLink 
We put NVLink on our processor, just like NVIDIA put it on Pascal. We put it on the power processor. And this really enables a whole new category of applications to come in and start taking advantage of GPUs. Uh, I was just talking to some of the vendors here, software guys who have databases with GPUs. They love NVLink. They love the CPU, GPU, NVLink because their problem is right now that is limiting the amount of performance they're getting out of the GPU. That's also limiting the number of functions they can move over to the GPU, right? They've moved only a select set of functions over. So NVLink allows both these processors. Again, the notion of peer computing. They're both peer processors, right? Um, and it also makes it much easier to program. Now, we have a new server coming with this, with Power8, uh, early shipments in fourth quarter this year. Uh, we actually have the server in the exhibits. So I encourage everyone to go check it out. Uh, you know, you can see Pascal, and you can see sort of on a motherboard whatever NVLink looks like. I guess. <laughs> but you know, we, we have a real server. We've been working very closely with NVIDIA on the bring up with N on NVLink as well. And IBM and NVIDIA are jointly launching an NVLink acceleration lab. So what this is, is we're inviting our clients to come to the lab, get early access to these systems, and we will help them modify their applications to fully take advantage of NVLink. Right, so this is something that we really want all our customers to come in, and we, we believe that this is going to change the game. NVLink will fundamentally change the game, and we want to help our clients take maximum advantage of it. So uh, any clients here, please do apply for the lab. Uh, that's the email address. If you know me, you can always email me. Um, now, you know, I, I, I feel like at the Open Power Foundation, having a slide that outlines the Open Power Foundation strategy might be sort of, I may be repeating what everyone else has heard, but you know, my view on this slide is very simple. I, I believe that Open Power came about because clients told us this is what they want. You heard Google and Rackspace this morning. Both of them essentially validated this perspective. They said, this lets us build systems, build solutions the way we want to. We want to have open interfaces. We want to have open collaborative technology providers. We want all the technology providers to bring technology to the table, and that's fundamentally what Open Power does. Um, you know, two small things I want to touch on before I end the conversation. Uh, IBM is also producing, a, uh, working on a lot of, I would say, next generation computing technologies. We have two in particular in research right now. We have a neomorphic computing uh, um, technology. Uh, we, we did a small press release on this a few days ago. But this is a fundamentally um, a chip that's being designed for cognitive computing, for deep learning. And it's still in research, but you know, Lawrence Livermore uh, deployed a small supercomputer with this. And the second thing is we've obviously been making a lot of advances in quantum computing. This has been a pretty interesting and hot space. Uh, again, something that IBM Research has quite an investment in. So last slide. I think, um, I think we, we, we saw this through not only my talk, but the talk before me from Oak Ridge, which is sort of the evolution of how HPC has come along. It really started in science, right? We started by building systems for weather forecasting, for nuclear simulations, all of that stuff. And it has evolved to where now we have systems uh, or we're building systems which will fundamentally model you know, the human brain, uh, blood flow. You know, there's all these things that we're going to do around the systems that we have. And we want to get to a point where we have systems that can model entire physical phenomena. Right? No more modeling some part of it or cutting out some part of it, but trying to really model the entire physical phenomenon. So that's it. I, that's my talk. If there's any questions, I think I can prob probably take one or two questions.